As we move into prayer, I just want to uh, take about three different scriptures that the Lord brought to my heart this morning and just pray through them in light of everything that's going on in our world. Psalm 46 is, a, in, in my regular Bible reading, I, I read through one psalm throughout the week and then uh, any other scriptures I'm reading through. And so I have this psalm that keeps rotating through my days for seven days. Psalm 46 was my psalm for the week. And many of you know it without knowing it. It's the psalm that has the cease striving and know that I'm God. But have you ever seen the context of that? Here is the refrain. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. The context is war, all out war. And then he says, be still. Or you could translate that, stop fighting. Doesn't our nation need to hear that right now? Stop fighting. Doesn't the church in America need to hear that right now? Stop fighting. And what is the solution? Set your eyes on God, not the things we're fighting about. Isn't that beautiful? He breaks the tools of war. And so with that in mind, let's pray together today. Father, would you in your mercy set our hearts so much on you today that we would indeed be a people who stop fighting. It's not that these issues are unimportant. They're, they're incredibly important. There are people's businesses at stake. There are people's lives at stake. Our very nation in some ways is at stake. The gospel is at stake in some of these issues. The humanity of people whose skin color is different. And yet at the same time, fighting and bickering and quarreling, it's destroying us. And so we pray, as with any revival that has happened, that you would begin revival with the household of God, with your own people. That we would be a people who are at peace and who stop fighting. By all means, let us be a people who stand up for truth and share truth, but let it be done with grace and love. Let our words be seasoned with grace, like we season a steak before we put on a grill and it, and it just immerses itself into that meat. Let your grace so change our hearts that the way we speak and the way we think and the way we act and the way we respond would be gracious. And that includes when we mess up that we would graciously be people who admit to it. Father, in the midst of all this strife, we celebrate your fatherness and the fathers in our lives. And as we look at the landscape of our nation, I can't remember a time when we have needed dads to be dads more than today. And so, like it says in Malachi, the promise of what your gospel does to societies. Would you turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers? Would you turn the hearts of fathers away from their careers, away from their toys, away from their hobbies? Not that these are bad things. But would you turn them fully toward their children and toward their families? And in so doing, turn the hearts of children toward their fathers. I'm so grateful for the men that you have put in this church. I pray your blessing over them. Bless them and keep them. Make your face shine upon them. Be gracious to them. Lift up your countenance upon them and give them shalom, peace, and everlasting confidence of your presence. Then they will be men. Then they will lead. Then they will love rightly. And my heart is always burdened for the guys and the gals that are mourning and grieving the loss of a dad. So we just cry out for them today. Isaiah 40 proclaims your comfort to the brokenhearted. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. 
And would you comfort those who are grieving a dad that's gone or a dad that was absent? And now, Father, as we turn our gaze to your word, we are asking you, Father, to bless this time. Show us what you want us to see through your words. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight because you are our God and you are our rock and you are our redeemer. And so open our eyes to truths that are bigger than we are. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, um, the passage that I am preaching from today is quite large, so I'm not going to read it beforehand. But I would invite you to take your Bibles and open them to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, and the text we're looking at begins at verse 28. We're going to read the text as we move through it. And as we prepare to get into this text, I was thinking this week <clears throat> about one of the saddest conversations that I've ever had in my life. I was sitting at a park bench in Sioux City, Iowa, with a friend from college. I went to school about 45 minutes from Sioux City. We were together, and he was going through some particular difficulties in his life, some very painful things that he'd experienced, and he was currently working through some stuff with a counselor in Sioux City. I was there to be a support to him. And that day, God had led him to a point of decision. And God was very clearly communicating to him, Will you trust me to walk with, the, with you through this? Can you put yourself in my care and under my authority? And that was really the big thing. Can you put yourself under my authority and trust me with this issue? We took a break from the counseling, sitting on that park bench. And over the next 20 minutes... He explained to me that he was walking away. He didn't want to face life under God's authority. In fact, he was angry that God had thrown him all these curves in life. He didn't feel like it was something he deserved. And then he got into his car and he drove away. And as he drove away, I did not have any idea at that point that this conversation was a defining moment in his life. He wasn't just driving away from me or from the conversation. He was literally driving away from God. He had made his decision. And today he lives in open rebellion. I would even say hostility toward God. He refuses to accept that God even exists, let alone his, his leadership. There is a God. And he has limitless power. And in his power, he has created everything that we know, even things that we do not know. He formed our bodies from the dust. He breathed life into us. He gave us an occupation. No matter what you do to earn money, your occupation is to enjoy God and to protect the world he made. That's your occupation. But do you understand that the entire race has rebelled against God? And that has caused devastation upon devastation upon devastation. When men and women are under God's authority, the world works. When men and women rebel against God's authority, that is when you find murder and rape and ethnic cleansing and discord in homes and divorce and viruses that threaten the globe, taking the lives of thousands, and race riots, and on and on and on and on. It is the rebellion of humanity that has caused these things. The problem with this world is rebellion against God's authority. And this is precisely what Matthew is trying to address in his gospel. So the fact that I'm cracking the book and we're going to back to Matthew should on some level cause a minor eruption of applause because that means that we're returning to something that's normal. We've, <laughs> we're going back to Matthew again. And so let me just give you months of Matthew in about 60 seconds or less, okay? 
We titled this entire series, The King and His Kingdom, because Matthew uses that kind of phraseology. He talks about Jesus the King, and when he mentions kingdom, what he's talking about is not necessarily the Jewish kingdom or an earthly kingdom, but God's reign, the kingdom that he is initiating on planet Earth. Through his first coming, it crashed into Earth, and through the church, it's advancing on Earth. And so these are, these are the terms that Matthew chooses to use for discipleship. The King, honoring the King, and serving serving in the king's kingdom. That's synonymous with discipleship for Matthew. And so chapters 1 through 4 of Matthew dealt all about the arrival of the king and how this king would deal with the rebellion of humanity. And then chapters 5 through 7 gives the ethics of the kingdom. That's the Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus is actually describing the kind of life that he wants to give to his followers, a life that is submitted to God, not in rebellion against God. And then we got to chapters 8 through 9, and we're in the midst of this next section where Matthew is actually telling us why everything in the Sermon on the Mount can be done. We can trust the lifestyle in the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus has the authority to lead us. So if you think way back to this winter, we see that all this attention is, is gathering around the authority of Jesus. We saw in chapter 8, verses 1 through 17, Jesus' radical authority to heal sickness. And in that is really just reversing the effects of sin. It is sin that leads to sickness and maladies in the human life. And then we saw in chapter 8, verses 18 through 27, that Jesus has this incredible authority over nature. Remember in the story of Jesus calming the wind and the waves, that he can take care of us. And the text we're going to look at today takes place right after the sea is calmed. And so in, in verse 27 of chapter 8, the men marveled once that sea was stilled. And they said, what sort of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? What sort of man can speak to the storm and say, stop, and it stops? What kind of a guy is that? Minutes after that happened, we move into the text for this morning. I'm going to look at two stories. So we're going to move through the stories rather quickly and see what Matthew is doing and what Matthew is recalling. And here's the first thing he shows us. Jesus has authority over the spiritual realm. So if you're taking notes, that's the first story. That's the idea behind the first story. He has authority over the spiritual realm. So if you have your Bible, Matthew 8, starting at verse 28. When he came to the other side, to the country of the Gerardines, two demon-possessed men met him. And coming out of the tombs, they were so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, what have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come to torment us before the time? We're going to stop there and just admit what, if you're not thinking it, you're not thinking. This is creepy. <laughs> they, get, they get to the other side of the, of the Sea of Galilee, which really isn't a sea at all. It's a lake, big freshwater lake. Get to the other side and they're in Gentile territory now. And they find themselves literally in a graveyard. A graveyard back then would have been an area with caves, small caves dotted the hillside and people would have put their loved ones' bodies in those caves and put a rock over it. That, that's how they buried people in ancient Palestine. I don't know why Jesus brings them here. I know that he's been busy doing a whole bunch of stuff over on the Jewish side of the lake and he's tired. And part of why he got in the boat is because he can actually get some rest. Remember, he took a nap while the storm was going on. So Jesus is refreshed. The disciples are not. And then he takes them to a cemetery and they got to be scratching their heads. Is this really where you want to go? And as if the creep factor weren't enough, they encounter two men who are possessed by demons. And they have amazing strength. Luke and Mark tell us that they're people that, that um, are so crazy and out of their mind under demonic oppression that, that they have been, uh, people have tried to chain them down for their own good and they burst the chains with this superhuman strength. And so nobody comes to this place anymore because these two men are there. Now what's interesting about the fact that we even encounter these demon-possessed men if I were to ask you, is demonic possession prevalent in the Bible, what, do you, what would you say? 
Most of you would say yes. Here's the interesting thing. It's not. And it's not because it wasn't prevalent in that day. It's that the predominant place we see demon-possessed people is, is in the Gospels. There are a few places outside of that, but, but somehow it ramps up in the Gospels. You say, well, why is it so prominent in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it's not as prominent in other places? I was thinking about this. Did you notice that quite a few of the protests that have happened around the country are for the most part peaceful until the presence of police show up? Have you noticed that? And honestly, the vast majority of the protests that have happened over the last few weeks and months have been peaceful. But there is an element that when the, the authorities show up, the, the protest in Sioux Falls was peaceful downtown, peaceful as they walked toward the mall, peaceful, peaceful. They got to the mall and there were a whole bunch of policemen there, there and all of a sudden the rocks started coming out. Why? Because the element of those protests was protesting against the authority they saw. And I believe this is why in the Gospels we see such a ramp up of demons. It's because the police have shown up. The one who has ultimate universal authority has come. And these rebellious angels, because that's what a demon is, a rebellious angel... They cannot help but make themselves known because they know who Jesus is, they hate Jesus, and there's a confrontation. And this is how we know that something radically different is coming with the presence of Jesus because the spiritual realm on planet Earth is beginning to shudder and shift and freak out. By the way, a theme through the rest of Matthew is going to start with this story, so if you can remember this today and kind of draw back on it, to know who Jesus is and to reject him is the very epitome of the demonic. It's terrifying the kinds of people who actually have demonic thinking in the Gospels of Matthew. We're going to come upon a group really soon in this sermon. Do you know what Jesus does here? For all the horror stories you've seen and movies you've seen and all the fear around demons, Jesus actually reveals that there's absolutely nothing to be frightened of. Do you see what they say to Jesus? What have you to do with us? Have you come to torment us? These demons are freaked out. Why? It's because the arrival of Jesus has ushered in a new era, an era of gospel victory on planet Earth. Jesus never tolerated demons. He always got rid of them. That's what he does. Jesus heals souls. He makes souls new. And so that's what he does in this story. In verse 30, it says, Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, go. One word, go. You see the authority of Christ? He doesn't need to say anything else. Go. And they go. It says they came out and went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down a steep bank and into the sea and drowned in the waters. An incredible act of mercy that Jesus gives to these two men. And I think it's difficult for us to wrap our heads around the torment that these guys must have been in. Mark's gospel only mentions one man. That doesn't mean there weren't two. It's just that Mark chooses to, to uh, highlight the one guy that Jesus talks to the most. And do you remember, if you remember the story at all, do you remember what uh, Mark tells us Jesus says? Jesus actually asks their name. And they can't give a specific name. They say legion. We're so many. We, 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 it'd take hours if we tried to tell you how many names. And then Mark says that Jesus cast them out into a herd of 2,000 pigs. Wrap your head around that kind of oppression from the enemy. And Jesus cast them out. And the pigs fly over the cliff to their death. There's lots of things you can think about this story, but in Matthew's mind, he goes straight to the herdsmen of the pigs, these ge Gentiles who are trying to take care of this herd of pigs. What might they think of all this? 33 says they fled. And going into the city, they told everything, especially what happened to the demon-possessed man. So what they just saw was absolutely unheard of. I need you to understand this. People in that day 
who were possessed by demons, which is much more common than we would think. It's that Satan has deluded us in America with materialism and comfort and ease, and so he doesn't have to be overt as much as he is. But mark my words, you run into people every day who are oppressed and possessed by demonic activity, and you don't know it. You go to Haiti, you know it. They're not deluded by materialism. And so what these men saw was absolutely unheard of. It's a game-changing authority. And they run to inform the city. What are they going to say? How is this going to be received? Verse 34, Behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave. What's going to happen? Is the city going to be thrilled that their own sons have been restored? Will they rejoice that Jesus has given two human beings created in the image of God their lives back? No. They're too afraid. They beg Jesus to leave. We don't exactly know why they're afraid. Here's two good guesses, I think. One is that they're more concerned about the pigs than they are human beings. Their true values are exposed. They're afraid that a person with that kind of authority could take away everything they have. Or perhaps, if it's not just about the pigs, maybe they're just afraid that a person with that kind of authority is going to demand more of them than they will ever be willing to give. They see this radical authority of Jesus and they reject it. They'd rather have the income from their hogs. Never mind that the hogs are Jesus's. He created them. He can do what he wants with them. Or perhaps they'd rather have their freedom, and so they reject this authority outright. Second story shows us that Jesus has the authority to forgive sin. So if you look at chapter 9, we continue. It says, getting into the boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some of the people brought to him a paralytic lying in a bed. So after this miraculous encounter, they return to their home base, Capernaum. And the people have been waiting. They've been waiting for them to show up again. And some friends bring to Jesus a paralyzed man. He can't walk on his own. They're bringing him on a bed. And so here is the question that I have for you. What is this man's main problem? It would seem obvious, right? He can't walk. That's a big problem if your legs don't work. Jesus doesn't see that as his problem. Text says, when Jesus saw the faith of his friends, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. Really? Your sins are forgiven? He can't walk. <laughs> the friends have brought him there so that he could have his, his ability to walk restored. And Jesus says, Take heart, your sins are forgiven. Jesus views the man's sin as a greater problem than the fact that his legs don't work. Now, that's kind of jarring to us, but let me ask you this. Which would you rather have? Would you rather have a knife pierce your hand and go all the way through, or a knife pierce into your heart? Literally. Literally. Like, well, I'll take the hand if that's, my, if that's my choice, because the hand can be fixed. Even if the hand never works again, I'll be alive. Knife pierces my heart, I'm dead. I bleed out, right? This is the scenario Jesus has in front of him. This man has been brought to Jesus with a serious condition. He cannot walk, but Jesus looks at him and knows that he has even a more serious condition. It's far worse than the inability to use his legs. He has sin, and this sin separates him from a holy God. This sin puts him on a trajectory to spend eternity without God forever. And so Jesus actually responds to him in the most merciful way he could. And as he forgives the man's sin, it gets him into trouble because verse 3 says, Behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. They get violently angry with Jesus because he said this. By the way, definition of blaspheme, it, it, it was a common thing in, in the first century Judaism. To blaspheme means to put yourself as a human being in the position of God. Human beings aren't supposed to be God. 
Only God can forgive sins. And so these leaders are angry. Verse 4 through 7 shows Jesus' response. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? Which one's easier? But that you may know that the Son of Man has, you can underline this, authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, go home. And the man rose and went home on his own two legs. See the interesting contrast here? Verse 2 gives insight into the faith of the man's friends. Their, their eyesight is on Jesus and his ability to do this. Verse 4 shows the evil in the religious leaders. We'll just call them the pastors. In the pastor's hearts. And I believe right here, Matthew is intentionally drawing a comparison. The pagans across the lake cared more about the pigs than the lives of those two men. These pastors care more about their right interpretation of the Bible than the soul of the paralytic. They are so consumed with their own religion, they can no longer love this guy. Do you realize that what Jesus did when he offered forgiveness was massive and was costly. Do you realize that in a few years from the time Jesus does this, he will go to the cross, he will lay out his body and be crushed and bled out for the sake of that man's sins. That's anything but small. And then Jesus offers him icing on the cake. Verse 6, But that you may know the Son of Man has this authority to forgive sins. Rise up and walk. Did you note that this healing is not just so the lame man gets a chance to walk? It serves to prove Jesus' authority over sin. If he can heal legs, he can certainly forgive if he can forgive, he can certainly heal legs. And we see the people's response in verse 8. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, just like the Ger Geradines were afraid. And I would guess that the pastors were afraid too. There is a certain kind of fear that happens every time we see the authority of God. But do you see what this crowd does? It says they're afraid. And they glorified God who had given such authority to men. So unlike the people across the lake and unlike the pastors who were standing right there, these average Joes and average Janes observe what has happened and they see something sp spectacular and they know that it's an authority that they've never seen before and they respond to the authority with worship. They respond by looking at that kind of authority as a gift, not a curse. Now listen. So much has happened over the last few months. So much is still happening in this world. And if it's not shaking you, then you're numbing yourself with Netflix too much. <laughs> Immersing yourself in work too much. If this doesn't shake you, I don't know what will shake your sensibilities. We're tempted to be afraid. We're tempted to be angry. We're tempted to be in despair. When everything begins to shake when the foundations that we're accustomed to no longer hold us, when life crumbles, might I suggest this is when we must know that someone else has us securely. We must know that there was someone with a greater authority that is holding us and the least that can happen to us is that we die. Do you know with every fiber of your being that this world for the Christian is a perfectly safe place to live? The worst that can happen to you is you die. And then glory. We have two responses to the authority of Jesus Christ. We can run away and we can reject it, either because we want our freedom or we want our stuff or we want 
our own particular intellect or our own interpretation of the Bible and we can guard those things so fiercely that we miss the authority of Jesus in the midst of it or we can embrace it and we can surrender to it. We need right now the authority of Jesus. We need his leadership. But if you're anything like me, you struggle with that sometimes because we see leaders who fail us all the time. I am a leader. I am consciously aware of how often I fail you. I hurt some of you sometimes. I don't get up in the morning and say I'm going to do it, but here's the reality. I will disappoint you. I will hurt you. I will let you down. I will do it with regularity because I am a human being. Don't put your trust in me. Don't put your trust in the president or in a government. Respect them. But you see, because we are let down over and over again by leaders, we ask the question, can I really trust Jesus? Can I really trust him with my stuff? Can I really trust him with my children? Can I really trust him with my marriage? Can I really trust him with my business? Is this a person I can actually trust? To which I would remind you this morning that the leadership of Jesus is unlike anything you've ever experienced on planet Earth. Jan Hedinga, in his wonderful book, Follow Me, Book on Discipleship, actually dares to speak on behalf of Jesus by just taking truth from the scriptures. And here is one of the most beautiful paragraphs I've read on the leadership of Jesus. Listen, this is from the perspective of Jesus. Here I am, Jesus says, nailed to your cross. Can you see who I am now? This is what I'm really like. I'm showing you that I'm humble, meek, lowly of heart. I'm self-giving, self-sacrificing in nature. I have your best interest at heart. I will not take advantage of you. I won't take advantage of you just because I'm stronger than you or smarter than you are. In fact, I'm letting you take advantage of my deliberate vulnerability. Have you ever stopped to think about the leadership of Jesus? That that is what he did? That's what the cross demonstrated? Is that he let us take advantage of him? In his meekness, in his humility, he allowed us to put steel that he himself created through his own hands and feet. The leadership of God sends Jesus to become a baby, supreme deity that created the universe, a baby, an infant, to live in an obscure and poor town, to be a construction worker. Not that there's anything wrong with construction workers. But God, the one who created the universe, became a construction worker. And he owned next to nothing. And he was humble. And this is how God chose to deal with our rebellion. This is how God chose to lead us. He could have crushed us, which he would have been justified in doing. And he chose not to. He could have obliterated all of humanity, but he has chose rather to come and to serve us. Let me ask you this morning, what more could he do to prove to you that he is a leader who's trustworthy, that his authority is a good thing, not a bad thing? What more could he say? What more could he do to show you that he is worthy of being trusted with every part of your life? He has proven to us that his authority is good, but what he asks of us in return is that we would entrust everything to him under his authority. And this is a process, is it not, brothers and sisters in Christ? I'll give you a heart test today that you can use to try to discern where your heart is in terms of this great authority that God has. I want you to just, in the quiet of your own heart and mind, Think of your most treasured things on planet Earth. Maybe they're people. 
Maybe they're objects. Maybe it's a business. Maybe it's an ability that you have or a position you hold. I want you to imagine the things that you treasure the most. And then I want you to imagine standing in front of Jesus Christ and taking that treasured possession and opening your hands and putting them in His. You got that picture in your mind? How does it make you feel? Does it cause you panic? Or does it cause you relief? Does it cause you alarm? Or does it bring you peace? See, that test shows where we are with the authority of Jesus Christ. And Matthew is is begging us here. He says, look, the people across the lake, they wanted their freedom. They wanted their stuff. The pastors, they wanted their intellect. They wanted their version of religion. But the crowds, the crowds that saw that man walk away on his own two legs, free from sin, they knew in that instant that they wanted Jesus. And as my friend drove away, he was leaving Jesus behind, don't you see? He's miserable today, aimlessly looking for peace. I know he's miserable because of how much he tries to advance atheism and preach it as a religion and spew hatred to anyone who will listen to him of God. Anyone there is a miserable person. But do you know that peace can be yours today if you want it? And that's what Jesus is offering you. He says, let me be your authority. Let me be your leader. And I will give you in exchange peace. So I wonder what you hear Jesus asking of you today. It's possible that he is knocking at the door of your heart saying, you have never, ever given me control of your life. You know all the right things to say. You have all the right religious words, but you have withheld your life from me. You've withheld your stuff from me. You've withheld your intellect from me. You've withheld your body from me. And today I want you. Today, I want to be your authority and I want you to give me everything so that I can lavish my righteousness upon you and I can give you peace. Maybe today is the day that you turn your life over to Christ. Or maybe you have turned your life over to Christ and he is inviting you to another level of discipleship. Is there a thing you're withholding from him? Is there a, a, a job you're withholding from him? Are you withholding from him your family because you can't imagine what would happen if they were taken away from you or if they were hurt? Maybe today is the day he's saying, I want you to give me these things as well because I love you and you hold on to them so tightly you've made idols out of them. Jesus loves you. Hear this, in the authority of Christ, he loves you. He wants all of you, not because he's power hungry, but because he knows that's how you will be the most joy filled in this life if you give it to him. A transfer of sin means a transfer of trust. A transfer of our rights to him gives us a transfer of affections of the heart that love him in exchange. Do you understand? That's the gospel. That's why it's good news. He says, let me be your authority and I will give you real life. What will you do with the authority of Christ? What will you do with this invitation today? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I would be foolish if I did not offer a moment for anyone who has never given their lives to Christ to simply pause and confess before you that they have sinned against you. 
they have fallen short of your perfect holy standard. And because of it, they are separated from you for all of eternity, separated from the fountain of living water, the real giver of joy and life in this world. And all they need to do is confess that they are sinners, confess that you are the only hope they have in this life, and so gladly give you their sin in exchange for your righteousness, to gladly give up their rights to being in charge so that they can have your acceptance and your love and your grace and your joy and all of the benefits that you lavish upon a human soul when they give up their right to be their own boss. And that there would be some here today who would simply kneel and say, I am a sinner. I need you. I want to follow you rather than somehow asking you to follow me. It's that simple. And that there are other people here today who know right now there is a thing, there is a concept, there is a person, there is a business, there is a position, there is something that I'm withholding from the King of Kings. Father, help us to see fully that our ownership of these things is an illusion. You owned the hogs. And you own all of our stuff too. You own everything. And so, Father, would you work a miracle in our hearts of sanctification and allowing us to loosen our grasp upon these things things and to give you the authority that you deserve as the sovereign king of the universe and in exchange we will have a release because when we hold tight to things those things control us when we hold tight to to positions those things control us and we're fearful and we're worried and we're harried but when we release them there is peace and there is joy and i pray over scandia free church that we would be a people radically released from the things of this world so that we might know the joy of serving you We're created for you, not for our stuff. Father, do a work in our midst. We shared testimonies last week. Let those come to bear. Set our church on a new trajectory of being freed from this world. Freed to serve you and to love one another. Would you accomplish this in our midst, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.